Well, hey, everybody. Welcome back to Fisting Jawa Save the Universe. I am Fist25, your host for this show and this review on one of the most infamous ships of the Tavaran War, the Asperia Prowler. We're here at the racing area at Grim Hex, which just so happens to be shut down right now. But uh, it's a good place for the Prowler because it's been known to be used by pirates. And I guess they frequent Grim Hex from time to time. Well, let's put the helmet on and get on with the show. It's coming at you right now. got its reputation as a formidable stealth dropship, going back over 400 years to the first and second of our wars. It was designed to sneak up and float about a target using its gravity emitters and drop the Tavarn special operations team out of the air shields, off the side, and then extract them once the mission was complete. It had remarkable success in taking over many Navy installations and struck fear into the heart of any UPE Navy ship. It was truly a bird of prey. However, the Tavarans lost, and all of the Prowlers were destroyed during the Tavaran Purge. Until, in 2941, a group of Pathfinders found an abandoned Tavaran settlement in the Cabal system. The Navy was called in, and they found full squadrons of mothball prowlers. They brought in Asperia to study the bird-like ships, learning all they could about Tavaran technology. In five years' time, the prowler was then revealed at IAE 2946. The ship, it seems to have had a second life, as Asperia has made the ship function for human use but retain some of the best bits of the Tavarin Hunter. The pilot and co-pilot screens are constructed of calcium, a composite that lets the pilot see out of the ship, but no one else can see inside. The gravity emitters let the prowler hug surfaces of a ship or the rough surface of a moon without impact. It was built for stealth, as the twin nacelles on the prowler contain low emission thrusters for a sneaky approach, and they can also rotate for VTOL and double as the ship's landing gear. The Prowler was designed to have four egress openings on each side of the fuselage, so each soldier can egress as fast as possible for rapid deployment. Each opening contains an air shield, which provided protection for each trooper from the ship's shields letting bullets go out, but not come in. As if that wasn't enough, the Prowler has the capability of using a phalanx shield, just like the Roman soldiers of old. The phalanx shield conveys a huge square shield in front of the ship, blocking all projectiles inbound, and when combining with other Tavarin ships, they formed a shield wall, protecting what was behind them. On paper, the Prowler is a lean, mean fighting machine. Or is it? It was introduced in the game in Patch 3.9 after a delay from Patch 3.8.2. And coming out of the gate, it was powerful. It currently sports two size 5 hardpoints on the main wings and a turret with two size 3 guns on top of the craft. Its stock loadout is two size 4 gimbaled Deadbolt 4 ballistic cannons, holding a paltry 180 rounds each. It also contains on the turret two Light Strike 3 laser cannons. When coming up into battle, the crew can open the doors and fire out on ground forces with rifles and other small arms while remaining protected by the ship's shield and not depressurized by using the air shield. 
but that is all the firepower the ship is going to muster. It was not built to fight other ships. It was built to get troops in, defend, and get them out. Now, this would all make sense if the ship was actually stealthy. But with the current state of stealth, it's not. Even with the best stealth components. The EM and IR measurements are, are so high they're easily found by other ships. The brochure states that the pilot or the co-pilot can operate the remote turret. But that isn't true when they're both in the seat. When both pilots are seated, the co-pilot only controls the main guns and is limited to the small angles of those guns firing forward if they're gimbaled. If they're fixed, he doesn't even have a center point to shoot at. The pilot, on the other hand, controls the turret guns, but has to enter the remote turret to move it around. With the current state of the game only letting one person in the pilot's or co-pilot's seat fly, this seems utterly backwards. The co-pilot should be able to enter the remote turret when the pilot controls the flying and the main guns. There are other issues. The Q&A for the Prowler said the gravity emitters would work like a gravlev bike, and the Prowler would hover over surfaces like a hover quad or a dragonfly. But it just doesn't. It runs into the ground. And the phalanx shield isn't even an option for the ship. That kind of technology doesn't exist yet in the game. And possibly the worst violation of them all, it's not even a real dropship. Yep. You heard me right. A dropship should carry not just troops, but also supplies or vehicles, much like the Anvil Valkyrie. This Prowler is an infiltration ship. It carries soldiers into battle, much like its competitors. The first one being the tried and true Aegis Vanguard Hoplite which emanates an air of professionalism with the heavy armor and good maneuverability of the Vanguard chassis. Its other competitor, the Drake Cutlass Steel, which is known for... well, nothing. Well, I guess it's known for a high price tag. But hey, what can we say? It's Drake. It does, however, fulfill its function as a troop carrier. It can quite easily handle some turret fire from a hardened bunker, land its troops, and then proceed to slaughter all of the occupants inside. Then there's the price. It's quite expensive out of game and real world money. It goes for $440 standalone. That's an enormous price for this ship. It goes for 4.2 million Alpha UBC in-game at Loreville. And that's not too bad. But this is true with all of the alien ships. It's normally called the alien tax. But compared to ships like the Banu Merchantman, which granted is still in concept, the Merchantman only runs $160 more at the time of this recording. It's 10 times the size of the Prowler, if not more. It's multi-role, multi-function. It's a better deal. Buying the Prowler with real money, in my opinion, is a bad deal. Well, I think that's enough talk. Let's take a look at the Prowler up close. And then, let's see how she flies. Right. So here it is. The Asperia Prowler. We're out here on the old pads at Grim Hex. I think we should take a look around the ship. Well, first things first. You see a lot of dots, a lot of hatches, ramp access, and a ladder. There really, really is only two ways to enter this ship normally. As I mentioned before, there is eight hatches where they have the air shield. Where the crew can extract and egress from the ship. Unlike the Talon, there is actually nothing on the front here 
of the ship. The Prowler is a little bit older design from uh, CIG, so it doesn't have that. These here are the gravity emitters that don't work. And they are mounted. Uh, there's four of them on each side of the ship uh, for a total of eight. I think it will be neat uh, one day if they do work. Above me is the Deadbolt 4 cannon mounted on a gimbal. That is a size five hard point with a size four weapon. Up in front of us, as you can see, it is the ladder. This is the normal way the pilot and the co-pilot would enter the seat or enter the ship. And we'll be doing that in just a few seconds. Over here is the eight different hatches. There's four on each side that uh, the crew can egress out of the ship and go do your special operations and things like that. Coming below the ship, we see it's a pretty straight center line here. The Prowler has a lot of angles and uh, all this webbing and things like that. It looks very bird-like. It kind of looks like a bird's nest. All this different web-like structures. As you can see, uh, there is four actual landing gear. There's two on the rear and there's two on each side. Kind of like if a bird put his feet down, I guess. Um, these are also VTOL, um, and they're also the uh, engines. I'm not sure why it says danger intake, because that's where the, the fire comes out. But when you put it in landing gear mode, this piece right here actually comes out of the stanchion, and it becomes the forward landing gear, one for each side. In the rear of the ship, there are two... Stabilators, I guess, is what we could call them. They they help maintain a better flight and atmosphere. Uh, one day when we do have movable surfaces, they should actually serve a purpose. In the rear, it appears that we have... Uh, is this the countermeasures? Yeah, the Joker, Joker DEFCON. So these are probably the decoys. In the very rear of the ship, we have uh, the loading ramp uh, for all the different crew members that, are, that can be on board, your people that are gonna be sitting in the seats. And right here is the ramp access. Well, let's go ahead and open that because we are gonna enter the ship from the other side. So if we click that, it very quickly opens the door and everybody can walk up into the ramp. And there we go. This is the ship without any power on. It looks very red, very dark, very bleak, very warlike. As a matter of fact, let's head on out. You can also close the door at this panel, and I'll show you the button on the inside as well. Coming around the starboard side of the ship, it is a direct mirror of the port side. So nothing new to see here. There's a graphical glitch on these back doors. Sometimes they appear, sometimes they don't. And yes, from the bottom, you can actually open the doors. Let's go ahead and do that now. Pretty neat. You can see where the air shield is. The air shield is always in place. You can see these red lines here because these have their own battery. So even if a ship loses power, the cabin will not depressurize. One of the bugs here, as you can see, I'm clicking and we cannot close the door. We actually have to close it from the pilot or the co-pilot seat. The last thing I want to show you on this ship, if we can see it, is up here. This is the turret. We'll get a better view of that as we get inside and go flying. But for right now, let's go ahead and enter the normal way a pilot or co-pilot would, that is from this door. And there we go. We are in the ship and the door closes on us. Before we hit the co-pilot, and that is a ladder right there, up there is the pilot seat. We will come back here and take a quick tour of the different doors and things like that. See, we can we can click here. We can open the doors. There actually is an air shield. It's hard to see. It's these red lines. And uh, I'm going to prove it to you because I'm going to take off my helmet. There we go. My helmet's off and I am not suffocating to death in the prowler. 
it is actually a working barrier. Now to open and close the door, this back door, we have to click that button. And then that opens the fast exit ramp out of the back and the light flashes. We're going to go ahead and close the door. At least that button works. Something works on this ship. If we attempt to close the door this way, it also will not close. So we're going to make our way forward. And uh, as you can see, there's there's not only drop seats up here, there's 16 drop seats in total. You can actually go into here as well. And the problem with doing this is if we look up this crossbar right now in this patch, it doesn't come down. So it does hold you in place, but it looks really, really weird. So we can get out of that bar or the, the seat area. We can keep moving on. This seat down here is the co-pilot seat, which we'll get into in a minute. And notice you can't actually see out of the cockpit right now. Just like the Talon, this has the, the opaqueness. Let's go up this ladder. We're going to climb up to the top deck of the Asperia Prowler. And this is where the components lie, and that is the pilot seat right there. If we come in here, we can click open. You can see there's various components. There's doors right here for components, right here for components, and one more right here for components. I think these are the electrical components, and I'm not even sure what that stuff is. So let's get in the pilot seat. Now that we've explored all the fiddly bits of the interior of the ship, let's go ahead and take a look around the cockpit. First thing we're going to do is start the ship up. Systems activating. Systems on. You see the viewport is open and we can see out of this viewport. However, no one else can see in. As we look around the cockpit, it is the standard HUD. Let's see what buttons we have down here. We have viewport off. If we click that, it will close the viewport. We can open it up right away. Over here on the right, we have cycle lock for our friendlies. Uh, forward, hostiles forward, all forward. Engine on, engine off. If we kind of go down towards the... I don't know if there's a actual button for it, but uh, there is a remote turret option. There it is. You kind of come by your knee. We can enter the remote turret. If we click that, you, as you can see, the pilot can control the remote turret as we're moving it around the ship. Can't fire because we are an armistice. Moving also around the cockpit, we have the power on and off switch and then the open and close exterior switch. Let's see if those doors, they actually did close when the ship started. But we'll go ahead and open all the doors and show you what that looks like. So that's with the ladder down, all the other doors open. We will go ahead and close exterior. There we go. The ship is locked up and ready to go. That is all the buttons, everyone. Um, I don't see any type of ejection or anything like that. Now, the pilot can take off in this ship, um, but so can the co-pilot. So let's go ahead and we will exit this seat. We will make our way down the ladder. Or back up the ladder. Okay, let's go down the ladder this time. We'll make our way into the co-pilot seat. Now, the pilot and the co-pilot seat are specially enforced. Once they move forward, there is a door behind them that closes. You can't see it from being in the cockpit, but 
There is a door that closes that seals off the pilot and the co-pilot from the rest of the ship. Just in case it depressurizes, you'll still be able to fly the ship from the co-pilot seat. Notice we... Let's turn everything on. Notice we have the same buttons as we did in the pilot seat. We have the viewport buttons. We have power on and off. Open and close exterior. And enter the remote turret. The caveat is, and it's a little weird, is that if there is a pilot and a co-pilot, the pilot controls the, rem the remote turret as a normal gun. The co-pilot down here controls the main two guns on the wings. So if you have a, a, a gimbal, which you can actually move around and move the guns around, that helps you out. If you have a fixed gun, you're firing dead center. It's kind of backwards to me. I would actually like the co-pilot to fire the remote turret and be able to enter the remote turret and let the pilot fly, and then they could fire the main guns. It would give the ship a little bit more versatility because if there's a pilot and a co-pilot in the vehicle, only the pilot can fly. The co-pilot can't fly because that technology is not in the game yet. So... It's just a little strange, I guess. Notice our Deadbolt 4 ballistic guns over here are only at 180 rounds. And our Light Strike 3s are at 67. Those are laser cannons. Um, those do recharge over time. We'll go ahead and max out our weapons. And our Light Strike 3s go up to 81. So we will center them back out. So, without further ado, I think we should take off on this ship get it flying let's do that now all right let's take her up and see what it looks like notice the two wings are kind of folded up when we lift up there's a little bit of flex and they will even out so that was definitely pretty cool we'll go ahead and bring in the landing gear and the wings fold up by themselves. We can hit K and go into VTOL mode. So the ship does actually have that type of mode, even though the gravity headers do not work. Before we actually take off on forward flight, let's go ahead and take a look at the, the top turrets up there. Well, the top turret, not, not more than one, but this top turret. There you go. There's the two Light Strike 3 cannons. I mean, at least it's some extra firepower, right? And we'll bring the VTOL up. We'll head forward. So traveling at SEM speed, it's, it's a little bit sluggish. I mean, it, it's, it's not too bad, but it's not super great. The roll rate isn't too bad either. Let's check the yaw. I would actually expect this ship to be a little bit more maneuverable, considering its price, I guess. It's, it's not a cheap ship at all. It's very expensive. Traveling at SCM speed, we are at about 178 meters a second. Let's go ahead and juice it all the way up. Those are the engines. There's some afterburner. Let me try to get dead on here. 1,115 meters a second. So it is pretty quick. Let's see how it moves at speed. One thing that is unique about the Prowler is that there is a ton of boost. If we hold down Afterburner here, as you can see, the boost is going down very slow. So there's a ton of boost for you to play with. As far as maneuverability in space, I would say it's average at best, and I don't know if it's 
better than a hoplite, to be honest with you. I don't trust myself inside these asteroids. So I'm going to get out of here. Let's test what this ship is like in atmosphere. We're going to head down to Gela and see how this ship flies in atmosphere. All right, we're on the sunny skies of the moon of Yella. Let's see how the ship handles. Right away, I can tell you at SEM speed, it is much more maneuverable as it should be, but it's still pretty slow. Although if you consider 176 slow for a drop ship, then I don't know. I'm not a professional dropship pilot, uh, but it doesn't seem as exciting as a fighter, of course. It does turn quite well around this map. Not bad movement rates in atmosphere. Now let's speed up. is getting pretty decent out here on the moon. I would imagine on a planet with thicker gravity, it would be much, much slower. I wish we had a little bit more in-game lore about some of the battles and operations the Tavarin used the Prowler in, since uh, it was their primary boarding craft and they did have such special elite troops. I wouldn't have wanted to fight them. I can tell you that much right now. So we are, we are moving. We're at about, well, we got up to about five, 500, 550. But like any other ship with a lot of mass, it does like to, does like to drop an altitude and it takes quite a bit off when you use the upward thrusters. All right, let's test out these gravity emitters and see how they work. So with the wings fully up and pushed back. I don't, yeah, we're just hitting the ground now. I don't necessarily see us. Yep, hitting the ground. Let's change the VTOL to on. This gives us much more control here on the ground because we're moving the thrusters but we're still just hitting the ground. I mean, you're gonna have to be a good low flyer if you wanna fly low in the Asperia Prowler. All right, so that is the Prowler uh, on land and in atmosphere in space. And now we're going to, uh, I think we're gonna go pick a fight a little bit and we're gonna see how this thing does in solo combat. All right, folks. We're about 19 kilometers from our target. We're going to at least try to throw on uh, our stealth mode, which you go to heat. Notice at the top here, our heat is at 12.4, our EM's at 26,000. So we will well, apparently lose that menu and we'll go back to heat. Our heat is at, uh, let's see, up here it says the IR is 12,465. We click it, it does go down a little bit. Let's see if that helps. The Prowler doesn't have any missiles at all. So you do have to rely on guns. So it's, it's kind of weird that it's a stealth ship without any missiles for infiltration at all. Okay, there's our target. This is an atmospheric mission. 
So I am not going to turn gimbals on because the dead bolts are not gimbaled. Actually, they are. Everything is gimbaled stock, so we can turn gimbals on. The Prowler does have a uh, size 2 Tavaring shields, which I believe are called Soldrafts. They're supposed to be better against ballistics. But we'll see. Headed towards our target. Looks like there's two, actually two targets out there. The first one's an M50. Great. Love M50s. What could go wrong? He is 100% jousting me. Let's see if the gimbals do indeed work. Boom! Got that guy! The other target, of course, is an Aegis Eclipse with infinite ballistic ammo. Let's see how well the Prowler works on this guy. He doesn't seem to be too happy. Boom! That's a big boom. And the Prowler, or the, the Prowler stood fast and the Eclipse is no more. So as you can see against these smaller ships, the Prowler did really, really well. Now let's see how the Prowler handles a bounty in space. All right, we're coming up on our target now into an asteroid field, into a ship that doesn't handle all that great. When the Prowler first came out, it handled much better, and then it was subsequently nerfed. Ah, Mustang Delta. No missiles for you, my friend. Of course, your friend has missiles, though. So, the use of boost is definitely going to help here. Being able to keep up with a much, much faster ship. Let's see how these Devil Force handle. Oh! That was pretty nice. Let's see how. It does with gimbals and eradicated. So that was pretty nice for the Prowler. What did you guys think? The actually the stock we weapons package isn't that bad, but I would prefer laser repeaters in my book. I think I'm going to equip those for the chase camera dogfight. But that's not what this ship does. That's not what this ship is for. This ship is a dropship. That's what it's good at, and that's what it should stick to doing. All right, guys, you know what time it is. It's time for the loadout section. I'm going to try to make this pretty quick because we covered a lot of this in the video already. Here is the Asperia Prowler. We can see it's DPS right now with the stock. Everything's stock on here. It's 2,234 DPS. Uh, we can see that uh, the inventory capacity actually shows up as 1.5 SEUs, so I guess that's enough to put some ammo in. Um, it has a high mass, 171,000 kilograms. That's probably one of the reasons it does move so slow. Uh, and its max pitch yaw and roll is 32 degrees pitching yaw, 125 degrees roll. As you can see, that wasn't that great. It is a, a ship with size two components, so we have a larger hydrogen and quantum fuel capacity. And you can buy the ship for 4.2 million Alpha UEC at area 18. Okay, back to DPS, 2234, 825 alpha damage. So I think the stock loader actually is fine for doing most missions. Everything's gimbaled, which is good. Uh, it's, it's easy to get on your target like that if you're pretty close. Um, 
But if you wanted to go for a more deadly loadout, which we're going to use in the chase camera dog fight, uh, we're going to go ahead and switch out our Deadbolt 4s um, with either Attrition 5s or Galdarines. I'm going to go with Attrition 5s because that's what I'm using in the video. Uh, they are a little more expensive and you have to get them in Hurston. And then I would swap out the Light Strike 3s with uh, Panther 337s. But in the video, I'm doing Attrition 3s. That changes our DPS over to 719. It's a little bit different because now we're not using cannons, we're using repeaters. But 660 alpha damage, you will get more shots on target, which hopefully in the dogfight helps you win. The burst damage is pretty high though, 3,025 DPS. Let's look at shields. These are the Sukaron. I'm sorry, I thought I said Soul Draft. Those are the size ones. The Sukaron are the size two shields. Um, the Tafarin shields. We don't have the Phalanx option, but we do have shields that are very, very good against uh, ballistic weapons and things like that. So uh, I really like uh, the Sukaron. Sometimes I borrow them off of these ships and I put them on other ships to give them. Uh, better ballistic resistance, I guess, is the word. Um, that's what they were designed to do, and they actually do it pretty well. They A little bit of ballistic damage does get through, but much, much less than other regular human shields. And they are good shields. 9,000 hit points and a 49-second recharge time because they are size 2, giving us a total of 18,000 hit points. Uh, and that's nothing to shake a stick at. So... What else? Uh, let's go look at the other things I changed. I did change the power plant because this ship is not stealthy, guys. It's not stealthy yet. Maybe one day it will be. But right now, they can see you from over 10K out. It's not stealthy. So with the power plants, I went with a military JS400, giving us uh, much more power than we had before with the stealth components. I didn't touch the coolers because coolers don't matter in 317.1. And plus, we got a ton of cooling over there anyway. I did change the Quantum Drive from a Stealth Grade C Nova um, over to a Military XL1 because that is the fastest size 2 drive. Um, and there you go. That is the loadout section of the Prowler. Uh, let's add our items to the cart. Let's check out how much it's going to cost to upgrade this. Uh, we're looking at 254,000 Alpha UEC. It's going to empty the cart here. I'm going to reset because the last thing I want to talk about is the hit points for the Asperia Prowler. Not that high. Only 21,950 hit points for the total ship. Um, now, granted, it has really good shields, but that means it's probably has pretty. It's going to have low armor. It's made to be stealthy and infiltrate. It's not made to be in a prolonged fight with multiple turrets, uh, multiple ground forces or multiple ships. But it can defend itself, so it's it's not horrible, but it's not great. And lastly, uh, well, before before lastly, take a look at the EM, the base EM with the base ship, with stock stealth components is thirty two thousand nine fifty nine, IR is over six thousand. Um, even if we upgraded everything to the most stealthy components we can, it's still not going to matter. They're going to see you from miles away. Lastly, let's talk about paints. There are four different paints for the Asperia Prowler. The first one being the brand new in 317.1, uh, the Harmony, Harmony Livery, which is uh, meant to showcase humanity's peaceful relationship with the aliens. It's kind of a semi pearlescent blue main coat marked with organic reflective red to suggest the coming together of disparate species and the cultures. It came out with Alien Week. Uh, 2952. The next paint shop is the Ocellus Livery. The Ocellus Livery replicates a look of the Prowler during the Second Tavar War. Uh, it is a pretty neat livery. Uh, it kind of has this bold red fuselage meant to draw attention and trick aggressors into shooting at the most heavily armored part of the ship, which is fuselage and it's not the wings. Um, thirdly, the Polar Camel Livery. This is pretty standard. Um, it's the white and gray camo paint scheme specifically designed for the 2950 IAE event. And it goes on a ton of ships along with the next paint scheme, the Stormbringer Livery, again, IAE 2950. And it's got this, uh, it's got these neat blues and, and blacks, and it makes the Prowler look pretty darn cool. Um, 
My favorite Prowler is the base Prowler because it's the silvers, it's the blacks, it's the grays. I think it looks really good. So with that, one thing I am not going to do is go over the brochure because I think it's boring and I don't just want to read to you stuff on screen. There's nothing that you haven't seen on there, but I, if you do want to see the brochure for the Prowler, please head on over to the RSI website, go to the Plague Store, check out the Prowler page, and you can look at the brochure there. It has some pretty decent lore that we covered already in the video. And uh, there is no ship commercial for this. So without further ado, we're going to head into the chase camera dogfight with myself and Java Sparky and maybe somebody else in the ship. I don't know. Uh, we've already seen the dropship stuff. We've seen the solo dogfights. We've played around. Let's get onto that. And here we go. Right. Here we go. Jawa took a mission from Crusader Security to help secure the asteroid belt around Yella. He ended up running in to two pilots. I mean, pirates. Jawa wrapped up his mission with Crusader Security, we got an urgent call from a pilot in distress, so we quantumed over there as fast as possible.
Well, after a long, hard day of shooting and pillaging and basically doing what the Prowler is meant to do, I think it's time to kick back here at Grim Hacks, have a nice cold beer, and uh, maybe go visit some of the seedier types here, maybe. Um, what did you think of the Esperia Prowler? Oh, what am I doing? I can't drink beer with my helmet on? Hold on. Ah, there we go. Much better. So, what did you guys think about the Asperia Prowler? Is it uh, a ship you would pay real money for? Um, I'm not sure that I would. It, uh, it definitely seems like uh, a ship that could be fun to use with a group. I don't know if it's any better than the... Pop light. I definitely think it's better than the, than the the atrocity that is the cutlass steel. But would you use it to board a ship? Would you use it in the future once boarding is like a real thing? I'm not sure I would. It certainly uh, has a stealthy aspect to it. It's got lots of fancy angles. It's got a place for two pilots. It can hold a lot of troops. It's got the fancy shields uh, that you can open up and shoot out of. It's got the gravlev thing where it hugs the terrain. And it's made by people that have feathers. So I got to say, this beer tastes horrible. But what else do you expect at Grim Hacks? Anyway, I want to know your thoughts on the Prowler, what you think of it, and uh, how'd you like the video? How do you like the newer format? Is it better? Is it worse? Does it still go on too long? Let me know what you think in the comments down below, and hopefully I won't be drinking beer when I reply. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the video if we uh, have earned it, and we do have a Patreon. Uh, YouTube channel member and Twitch subscribers. If you want to support the channel, you get some special gifts. Well, not gifts. You get special privileges in our Discord, early access to videos and other perks. And you can even uh, be in some of the videos or help us out with filming or whatever you want to do. Um, uh, Joe and I appreciate everything you guys do. I can't say enough good things about the community here at the Sons of Valhalla Discord. And with that... I think it's time to call it a night. I got a couple more beers to drink. Remember, if the fist don't get you, the lightning bolt will. Good night, Stan. <sighs> Delicious. <laughs>